My name is Arthur. I've been a trucker for various companies for the better part of 15 years now. Things have become pretty routine at this point, pick up the goods and materials, verify them for accuracy, and deliver them as instructed. We're not paid by the hour, so efficiency is the most important thing in this line of work. For someone like me who's been doing this forever, I like to think I can outwork all these young guns that are snapping these jobs up. This isn't always great, though. Usually, I push myself to the absolute limit when it comes to functioning on barely any sleep. Four years ago, I was working for a warehouse based in North Dakota. For anyone who doesn't know, North Dakota is one of the flattest states, which makes trucking a little easier. This also meant that skipping out on a few hours of sleep could mean the difference between employment and getting the sack. It was a chilly Tuesday morning in May. The beginning of the week meant that more loads needed to be shipped, which meant more work for me. I wanted to knock it all out in one shot, so I traced my route into Montana accordingly, planning on not stopping even once to sleep. I hit the road a few hours after lunch, expecting to reach my destination very early the next morning. I pushed the semi as much as possible, doing maybe a couple over the speed limit. It was getting late, and I remember rubbing the crust from my eyelids as the clock ticked past midnight. I was having trouble keeping my eyes open, but I only had about an hour left in this drive, so I gritted my teeth and kept going. My buddy Tristan, who was also a trucker, introduced me to smelling salts when I first started out. If you don't know, smelling salts are basically some kind of crystals in a little bottle. One sniff and you're wide awake. You had to be careful, though. Too many back-to-back -back uses could be dangerous, or at least that's what Tristan told me. They burn your nose a little bit, but whenever I needed a boost, I'd reach for the smelling salts first. This was one of those times. I took a big whiff and shot my head back, my reflexes taking over. I felt the adrenaline course through my body and hoped the feeling would last the rest of the drive. A half hour shot by, and I was really struggling. I felt myself start to doze off, and the blare of my truck drifting into the shoulder jolted me awake. This was getting dangerous, I thought. I had to pull off. I was all alone on the highway, but there was nowhere to pull off, there were just woods on either side of me. I slowed the truck down, searching desperately for somewhere to pull over. At this low speed, my headlights pierced through the darkness, and I was able to see a lot more. As I looked around, I saw something that confused me, there was a purple dress lying in the middle of the road. What the hell, I thought, rubbing my eyes. Was I hallucinating? I blinked like six times just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. It was real. I approached the dress with my truck and stared at it as I rolled by. In hindsight, this should have been more of a red flag, but I think I was just too exhausted to process what was going on. About 200 or so yards away, I passed a pair of shoes. Now I was starting to freak out. What the hell was going on? I passed the shoes, praying to God there would be a place to pull off soon. My old man Finn was a super religious guy, so I clutched his old cross and hoped he would come through for me. A little further up the road, I saw a bunch more random clothing, some of which looked like little kids' clothing. This time, I stopped the truck. The panic started to set in. Something was very, very wrong. I sat in the driver's seat with the truck at a standstill. I was expecting something to happen, but it never did. So I did what my instincts told me to do. I stepped out of the truck and went to inspect the clothing. I still remember the feeling of the chilly morning air piercing my skin, which definitely helped my exhaustion. I approached the pile as cautiously as I could. It was indeed kids' clothing. 
It looked like there were both boy and girl pieces of clothing in the pile. I looked around into the woods, but I couldn't see much of anything in the darkness. I had my head on a swivel, worried that this was some kind of trap. I decided it was not my business to figure out what was going on, so I made my way back to my truck. Just then, I heard a crunch from the left. I whipped around, trying to see what was there. I stood there, waiting to hear another sound. After about 30 seconds, there was another crunch, but this time from the opposite side of the road. My survival instincts kicked in, and I sprinted towards the truck. I jumped into the front seat, but just before I slammed the door, I heard a child scream ring out. I froze, my heart bursting out of my chest. I was caught at a crossroads. I wasn't going to fight some random people in pitch black woods, but I couldn't just abandon some helpless kids either. Before I could make a decision, another almost identical child scream rang out. Without thinking, I turned the truck on and pointed its nose toward the spot in the woods where I heard the noise. My headlights lit up about 30 yards into the woods. There were three or four people, one of whom was holding a massive speaker. They ducked behind a couple of trees as my truck lit them up, but I had exposed them for just enough time to make out what they were doing. They hid from the light before I could really make out any distinctive features, but I swear on my old man Finn's grave, they were holding up a speaker, trying to lure me into the woods with a fake kid screaming. I was just in shock. I just sat there staring at the trees those people had just hidden behind. I reached for my phone to call the police, but before I finished dialing, I heard a thump from the body of the truck. Someone had thrown something from the other direction. I was done. I turned back to face the road and slammed on the gas. As I sped off, I could make out a person on the other side of the road. He shouted something I couldn't understand before launching something at the truck that cracked the glass of my passenger side window. I drove the final hour in silence. I was too scared to process what had just happened, but there was no way in hell I was stopping to sleep in those woods. I completed my delivery and then knocked out. I must have slept for 10 hours straight. When I woke up, the first thing I did was call the police, who told me they'd investigate those woods and give me any updates. I then thought about. We were hitchhiking through Europe, my then boyfriend and I, and on our way back home, a truck driver picked us up. We had had a few weird encounters on our trip before, but we had been on the road for about a month, and nothing really scary happened until we met this guy. He was a young guy, about 25, quite regular, spoke English okay, and had been away from home for a long time. I was a bit younger, with my boyfriend being around his age. My boyfriend was tired, so he took a seat on the bed in the truck and wasn't really trying to hold a conversation. During our trip, we switched turns as I usually do when I hitchhike with someone. One person talks with the driver, and the other relaxes in the back, so I was in the passenger seat. I think my boyfriend was even dozing off a little bit when the driver started complimenting me and asking about my boyfriend. It was still fine, nothing too weird and I was just trying to talk to be good company. As we moved on, I started to feel a bit uncomfortable, but I didn't let anything on and only told my boyfriend that we should find truck drivers from our country to make the last part of our trip in one go. I translated this to English immediately because the truck driver became agitated and suspicious of what I was saying. I explained that we were really tired and our plan was to find our truck drivers before he had to take a long break so that we could continue traveling without interruption. We stopped for a short break at a gas station, and my boyfriend decided he was going to look for another truck driver in the parking lot, leaving me with this guy alone. Damn, the truck driver came on to me real hard, and I was scared shitless and didn't fight back. 
I could feel how aroused he was, and there was no doubt about his intentions. Luckily, my boyfriend was away for just a minute. At that moment, I realized we needed to get out of this situation fast. I didn't want to say anything to my boyfriend because I was scared of how he would react, so I decided to pretend nothing had happened. I was determined to get out at the next stop. We reached a large gas station for truck drivers only and told our driver we were going to look for other drivers heading our way. During our trip to this station, this guy got in touch with another driver, saying he could also take us, maybe one at a time. Damn, I thought, now he's planning a threesome. When I was finally alone with my boyfriend, I remained calm, hinted at what had happened, and insisted that we not stay with this driver no matter what. It took us about five minutes to find a group of truck drivers from our country. They were having beers and cracking jokes, and two of them agreed to take us. I jumped with joy. We went back to the truck to get our things. The guy had already brought his friend along and was offering my boyfriend to take a shower at the gas station, saying he would pay for him for no obvious reason. He was quite persistent, and as I very well remember, he never offered it to me. Needless to say, these two guys were very disappointed to see us go. I still remember how they were looking at me when I was taking our backpacks from the truck. I have never told my ex-boyfriend the details. I was just lucky that we got away from that truck driver, and I think he has never realized how bad the situation was. At that time, I was playing it cool the whole time, but inside, I was shaking. I could see how desperate that truck driver was and how much he wanted to get rid of my boyfriend. I was so angry at myself for staying with him in the truck by myself, but then all of our things were there. I was also angry for not fighting him back, but it was so sudden, and I got really scared. I've been a trucker for close to 15 years now. This happened to me in 2017. I was driving an overnight haul through the Mojave Desert in California, headed for a destination in Arizona. I think I was delivering appliances, but I don't really remember. It was pitch black darkness in every direction. The headlights on my semi were really dim at the time, and I'd been putting off getting them fixed forever. Usually, I couldn't tell the difference, but since there were basically no other cars on the road, it was much more obvious. I remember having to strain my eyes every few minutes to make out the road in the distance. That could have been a horror story in and of itself. I was debating pulling over for a couple of hours and waiting for sunrise, but I didn't want to waste my time. I desperately needed the money at the time, so I kept driving even though it wasn't fully safe. I figured since it was basically a straight line, it would be okay. I think it was about an hour before sunrise when I saw something approaching fast in the distance. Worried about hitting an animal, I slammed on the brakes. As my truck screeched to a stop, I realized what was in front of me, a car with its hazards on. The weird thing was that it was in the exact middle of the road, literally on the double yellow. What was even weirder was that the passenger door was wide open. My truck stopped maybe a foot before hitting it. Not to toot my own horn, but I'm a pretty fearless guy, and I know my way around a bar fight. Because of this, I wasn't really scared when I saw the car, I was more curious than anything. I thought maybe someone needed a jump or something, so I reversed the semi and pulled over. I thought about throwing some flares down but decided against it since I hadn't seen a single other car on the road besides this one. I got out of my truck and made my way over to the car. It was a warm, still night. I remember thinking how strange it was that there was almost no wind. It was also really quiet that night. The faint click of the hazards was the only sound in what felt like the entire desert. I got a little closer to the car. 
I vividly remember that it was a new-looking red Ford Fusion. I approached the car a little cautiously. Like I said, the passenger door was wide open. I walked around the car and stopped in my tracks. It was completely empty. I made sure of it too, checking the back seat and anywhere someone might be lying down. There was literally no one inside. All of a sudden, I was much less sure about the situation. I was expecting someone to need help of some sort, maybe even someone who took a nap in a really dumb spot. I certainly wasn't expecting this, though. The car was literally empty. I cast a few glances over my shoulder, feeling a lot more uneasy now. I kept whipping my head around, looking in every direction. I felt like someone was going to charge me or something. The problem was it was so dark that I couldn't see that far in front of me except for what was lit up by my truck's headlights. It was eerie. I waited a while longer, thinking about getting back in my truck and forgetting about this whole thing. Someone was out there somewhere. Against my better judgment, I decided to keep investigating. I looked inside the car, but everything seemed completely normal. The key was even in the ignition, although the engine was turned off. I got back out of the car and made my way over to the trunk. Might as well have a look, I figured. I went to open it, but it wouldn't budge. Locked. I grabbed the key out of the ignition and unlocked the trunk. Still, though, the thing wouldn't budge. It was jammed from the inside somehow. I opened the back door and tried getting at the trunk through the back seat. To my surprise, it actually opened. There were three squished garbage bags back there, along with a rope that was tying the trunk closed. I remember glancing one more time over my shoulder before reaching for them. The coast was clear. I must have been within five inches from one of the bags when the loudest gunshot I've ever heard rang out into the night. I slammed my head on the roof of the car in shock. I didn't even think. I threw the keys on the front seat and got out of the car as fast as I could. As I was climbing into my semi, I heard a grungy voice yelling in the distance. He yelled, hey, a bunch of times, and his voice seemed to be quickly approaching. I scrambled into the semi and turned it on. I threw it in gear as fast as I could. I remember cursing a bunch of times as the engine initially stalled. And that's when I saw it. As my truck began pulling out, I saw a person standing at the trunk of the car. It was a short husky guy with red hair. He was wearing overalls and shin-high boots. In his left hand, he was holding a small shovel. In his right, though, was an old-looking hunting rifle. We locked eyes for a few seconds as my truck began to drive past him. He didn't move. I remember him not looking crazy or anything. He had this worried look on his face. As I passed him, he dropped his shovel and started waving his hands. He yelled, wait, a few times, but I wasn't staying there another second. As I drove away, I watched in the rearview mirror as he ran after my truck for a few seconds before sprinting back to his car. It was clear he wanted me to stop, but there was absolutely no way I was going to do that. I stepped on it pushing the semi much faster than I should have. I drove for like five minutes and started to think I was in the clear, but then I saw headlights fast approaching behind me. I remember feeling more scared than I've ever felt in my entire life. I called the police and told them what happened to the best of my ability. That's when the car was basically right on my tail. It started honking like crazy at me, I honestly didn't know what to do, so I just kept driving, praying to God he wouldn't try and ram me. After like 15 minutes of this, he cut in front of me and hit his brakes, forcing me to slow down. I was just about to crash into him when finally some flashing police lights appeared ahead. 
the Ford veered off to the right and sped into the desert, disappearing from sight. I pulled over and waited for the officer to show up. I frantically told him what had happened, but the useless cop decided to get a report from me rather than chase the guy down. I was so pissed about that. I told the guy like twice that he could probably catch up to him if he left now. The cop told me not to worry and that they'd do a thorough search as soon as backup arrived. He sent me on my way and said they'd call me if they ever had an update for me. They never did. None of my buddies have a story this crazy, and I've told it more times than I can count. I know what you're probably thinking, that guy was definitely burying bodies. That doesn't really explain why he had such a small shovel or why he tried to follow me. The bags in his trunk were also too small for that, although some of my buddies think he might have done some dismembering. For my own sanity, I like to think that he was burying some other kind of animal, maybe putting a diseased dog out of its misery or some dangerous snakes. I really have no idea. Either way, I've never been totally comfortable driving through deserts late at night after this experience. About seven years ago, on my way home from my parents' house, I experienced something truly terrifying. I was 22, young, naive, and well, dumb. I had just moved into my first apartment, becoming the first in my family to leave our sleepy old train town. I visited home every Sunday to see my family, do laundry, and enjoy Sunday dinner. I lived about 45 minutes up the highway, so I generally headed home by 6 p.m. On this particular night, there was a relentless summer thunderstorm that had been pouring down rain all day. Just as I was packing up to leave after dinner, my cousins dropped in, so I ended up sticking around for a few more hours to visit. I left my mom's around 10 p.m. in the pouring rain. This was the first time after moving out that I encountered something that truly scared me. I never told anyone about this, possibly out of pride, everyone always gave me trouble about living alone as a single female in a new area. Anyway, here it goes. I left my parents' house around 10 p.m. In the pouring rain. I'm driving down the service road that leads out of town and eventually turns into the on-ramp to the highway. As you leave town, the service road turns into one lane right in front of a quarry train loading station. I'm not really clear on what that place is, but it always gave me the creeps. If you're unfortunate enough to pass through when a train is crossing the road to load, you'll be stuck there for a while. Once the road passes the tracks, it turns back into two lanes and goes up a steep hill. As I'm approaching the quarry, I can make out the orange lights on a red cab 18-wheeler sitting in the quarry parking lot. Mind you, it's pouring rain, visibility is low, so I can't make out the trucker until I'm pretty close to him. As soon as I can see it's a trucker, he pulls out into the road. I had to slam on my brakes to avoid hitting the trailer on the back of the truck. I skid around on the road until I regained control of the car. Now I'm stuck behind this dummy who just pulled out without paying attention. I keep my distance because I'm flustered. For the record, my headlights were on, so if he had been paying attention, he should have seen me. Honestly, with the heavy rain and low visibility, who knows? So, I'm behind this guy as we cross the tracks and begin to climb the steep hill. Despite it turning into two lanes on the hill, he's driving right up the middle of the two lanes. Figuring he didn't realize it was two lanes, I just putter along behind him, keeping my distance. As soon as he reaches the peak of the hill and the road levels out, he moves over to the right lane. Yes, finally. So, I move over and begin to pass him. As soon as I get past the front of the truck, he swerves behind me quite abruptly and begins flashing his high beams at me. 
Usually, when someone flashes their lights behind you in our area, it means turn on your lights, but mine were already on. I checked as soon as he started flashing at me. Weirded out, I put my blinker on and safely change lanes to get out of his way. He follows my lane change and begins laying on his horn. The honking startled me, and I began to get a lot more flustered. What the hell did this guy want? I moved out of his way and my headlights were on. Why didn't I just speed up and zip away, you may be asking. Well, I grew up in this area. It had been raining heavily all day, and I knew that the service road floods a little in heavy rain, both on the shoulders and in random spots in the middle of the lanes. It's a small Midwestern town, our roads are shitty. I had already skidded and nearly wrecked once, and I wasn't about to floor it on this bumpy, flooded service road and risk wrecking again. There is nothing between that quarry and the highway, just about four or five miles of wooded area. If I wrecked, it would have been just him and me. This went on for the next four or five miles to the highway. He began tailgating me in addition to the high beams and hunking. Once the tailgating began, I was in tears. I didn't know what this guy wanted from me. I was just trying to stay out of his way and get home safely. That's all I wanted. I changed lanes two more times, making three total. He followed me from lane to lane. As we approached the highway, I floored it. He couldn't accelerate quickly enough to keep up, and I lost him finally. As soon as I realized I'd lost him and was safe on the highway, I just lost it. I was a hysterical wreck. There is only one exit after getting on the highway to stop in the small town the highway runs through. After that, it's all wooded for a good 30 minutes. Here's a more structured and coherent version of your text with appropriate pauses. I thought about getting off at that exit to calm down and pull myself together, but I just wanted to go home, so I sped right past it. I should have stopped. Once the city was no longer visible in my rearview mirror, I felt much calmer. I managed to scramble my cell out of my purse and put it in my lap just in case. The rain led up to a drizzle the further I went, but I was still pretty on edge. There weren't many other cars on the highway, and most of them were truckers. I'm cruising along in the center lane when the truck next to me in the passing lane begins blaring the horn and moves into my lane, forcing me over to the third lane. He continued moving over, nearly forcing me off the highway. I sped up and changed lanes right in front of him so that I'm back in the center lane. I slowed down until I was in line with the front cab. I double-clicked the home button on my phone, camera shortcut, and rolled down my window, starting to take pictures of the cabbie. I think the flashes made him realize what I was doing, and he began slowing down until he was behind me again. I got a lot of pictures. I sped up and lost sight of him behind me. I was satisfied I managed to get pictures, but I was so angry at this point. I pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway and waited for him. I just wanted to get behind him so I could get a picture of the license plate and report this. Sadly, he was on to me for sure. I noticed headlights behind me a long way back, but behind me nonetheless on the shoulder of the highway. I waited, keeping an eye on the truckers passing me by, just to be sure I didn't miss him. I noticed a shadow pass through the headlights of the truck, which spooked me quite a bit. Did he get out of the cab? I didn't stick around to find out. I just took off and got home as quickly as possible. The pictures were a total failure. It was still drizzling, the flash combined with the drizzle just resulted in washing out the pictures. I could see the red cab, but no matter what filters I used, there was no making out exactly what the cab said. Red cab trucker, you're the reason I have a dash cam in my car.
I'm sure you've seen some of the more modern videos online where truckers document their daily routines and provide tips for each other. Or maybe you haven't, but being as I'm on the younger side in this industry, every time I open TikTok or YouTube shorts, that's all I see. I won't get into it, but I had to drop out of a pretty prestigious university for some personal reasons, and people always tell me I could have been more than a trucker. It's honestly not a bad gig though. I've been making deliveries for north of two years. Obviously, the only strenuous part of the job is the long hours. You can never truly gauge how the isolation will affect you without experiencing it firsthand. My only advice would be to make peace with whatever demons might be lurking in your subconscious because they'll definitely eat at your brain in the lonely hours. That's what happened to me anyway. This happened to me three months after getting employed by my first company. I was basically as new in this trade as one could get. I was driving from southern New Jersey to Lafayette, Indiana, a 12-hour drive. 12 hours driving might not seem that crazy, but factor in the fact that I had just completed an 8-hour trip, and that should put things into perspective. I wanted to get deliveries done as quickly as possible, so I opted to drive through the night. I did to Lafayette just before 3 a.m. things were going smoothly. There were virtually no other cars on the road, so I was able to push the semi a little faster than normal. About halfway through the drive, I remember reaching down at the center console to chug a Red Bull, but there weren't any. Of course, I had forgotten to restock my truck after completing my previous delivery. After slapping my dashboard a few times, I groaned in frustration, knowing I'd have to stop somewhere. There was nothing I hated more than having to make stops during my drives. I might be unique in this, but I always get exponentially more tired when my vehicle is immobile, even if I'm only stopped for like 20 seconds. After glancing up at the navigation, I figured I had no choice, either fall asleep on the road or stop and get an energy drink. In my brain, those options were pretty much equivalent. Reluctantly, I pulled into the first service stop I saw. I had literally no clue where I was, probably somewhere in Ohio at this point. Too late, I realized this wasn't actually a service stop. It was what looked like an abandoned gas station and a repurposed convenience store. Not sure if there's any better way to describe it. Either way, it looked like there was another quick stop store not far up the road, so I figured I'd go there if anything. I parked the semi, I made my way over to the first convenience store. To be completely honest, I was expecting one of two things to happen, either the place would be open, or the door would be locked. You can imagine my surprise then when the door swung open into a pitch black store. I looked around, hoping maybe I'd get lucky and there would be a drink or snack left behind. Just before I was about to turn around, my eyes adjusted to the darkness, and I picked up on a faint glow emanating from the corner of the room. I made my way over to it, and the glow turned out to be coming from a back room of some sort. Curiosity got the better of me, and I opened the door slowly. To my pleasant surprise, there was a plugged-in refrigerator against the wall. Eagerly, I opened the door but found nothing. Literally nothing. The shelves had been removed, the whole appliance had been gutted. As I was shutting the door, I was 90% certain I heard a clatter from the main room, like something hitting the floor. I froze for a good 10 seconds. Had I imagined it? There was no way. Quietly, I walked back into the main room and looked around. Nothing. Part of me wanted to keep investigating, but I didn't have time for this. I walked out the entrance door and basically jogged to the other shop. It was open, thank God. I paid for my drink and made it back to my truck. Something about this whole stop felt wrong. I needed to get back on the road as soon as possible. 
I took one last glance at the abandoned store and noticed the door was now open. I was 100% positive I had shut it behind me. It wasn't my job to figure out what was going on here, so I started the engine and merged my semi back onto the highway. The caffeine started kicking in and snapped me out of my tired haze pretty quickly. My mind began to wander, and I started thinking about how bizarre that whole thing had actually been. I guess a squatter or an abandoned building wasn't the strangest thing in the world, but my brain couldn't explain that refrigerator, no matter what theory I thought of. I tried to forget about it and kept driving. It was then that I started noticing weird movements in the curtain behind me. Sweat started dripping down my forehead. I watched in the rearview mirror as the curtain seemed to billow and move, even though I didn't have the air on. I thought the worst, there was someone in my truck. I didn't have any weapons on me or anything, so I discreetly punched in the nearest police station on my phone. The drive there was the most tense and horrifying 20 minutes of my life. I kept imagining that person reaching out to grab me or trying to crash my truck. Finally, I approached the police station. I stopped the semi as close as I possibly could get and basically ran over to the police station. In seconds, my truck was surrounded by police, and after I opened the back, what I saw will stay with me for life. The police pulled out three homeless-looking people, two men and one woman. They were wearing rags and were wrapped in nasty-looking blankets. One of the men was armed with two switchblades. All three of them refused to talk but stared menacingly at me as they were getting cuffed. I have no idea what they wanted. I don't think I'll ever know, 